Uh, welcome to our research seminar, and I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Jeff Luck, who's an associate professor in is it health policy now? It's health management policy. Health and management, management policy. policy. Management policy. Uh, okay, I want to make sure. I, I'm, in, I'm in there too, but I never know. <laughs> 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 we have multiple names, but health management policy, it's P and uh, and Jang Ho Yoon, who's also an associate professor uh, in health management and policy program, are going to present on some uh, work that we've all been working on for six years. So, take it over, John. Thanks. Uh, well, first, well, welcome, everyone. This is our, our first, the first time we've talked about this, I think, within the college as a project. We present about it in, in various other venues. So, um, what what will happen is that I'm going to talk about the project uh, in an overview sense for about 10 minutes. Uh, then I'll hand it over to John Ho, and he'll talk about a couple of the analyses that we've done, and then I'll come back and talk about the third uh, analysis. So we hope that will take about 40 to 45 minutes, then we'll have the last 15 minutes for questions. Um, questions about the analyses or about the project, if you're doctoral students, or postdoctoral scholars, data sets, any of that stuff. We hope to be able to have a dialogue with you guys about So, um, as Marie introduced us, and so today we'll talk about what's been a, a multi year uh, CDC funded project. The vehicle for that project was something called a cooperative agreement. And, and a cooperative agreement uh, started with a funding opportunity announcement from the CDC uh, Division of Reproductive Health that they were interested in research about the impact of Medicaid expansion on the target populations for their division. Um, but the research questions themselves um, were uh, largely defined by the project team in collaboration with, with folks at CDC. And some of the, the project officers at CDC are actually uh, themselves MPH or PhD trained epidemiologists who also publish research on their own. So it was actually, it, it was a collaborative um, relationship over those several years. But from the OSU side, the project uh, team um, includes Marie and I, who were uh, dual PIs on the project, um, and Zhang Ho was our um, indicted conspirator uh, from the very beginning of the project. Um, and so that, that was the core of the uh, leadership of, of, the, of, of this study. Uh, we've worked with three really uh, great uh, faculty and uh, postdoctoral scholars over the years. Susanna Gibbs, who's here, Lisa Oakley, who's um, gone on to CDC, Jocelyn Warren, who helped us get things started at the beginning. Uh, several doctoral students, especially Lynn, Annie, and Shama, have work, worked on the project um, over a significant period of time. So you'll see, what, what you'll see is in many ways uh, shared by various combinations, of, you know, produced by various combinations of that group. So the, I want to give you a little bit of background about the policy changes in Oregon that uh, uh, provided the, the motivation for this study. So first of all, in 2012, Oregon began delivering care to its Medicaid beneficiaries through something called coordinated care organizations. I'll tell you a little bit about them. John Ho will tell you some more detail. But if you hear somebody in Oregon Medicaid talk about delivery system transformation, it means moving to coordinated care organizations. And then in 2014, uh, the nationwide, uh, Several states, about 30 states, expanded eligibility to Medicaid um, under the Affordable Care Act. And so that Oregon was one of those states. That also had some big impacts on the Medicaid program. Those two changes together, CCOs plus ACA expansion, uh, were expected to improve access to care, utilization of services, and health outcomes among Medicaid beneficiaries in general, and women and infants in particular. So let me tell you just a little bit about CCOs, um, some of you all in health policy know this, but um, a coordinated care organization is a collaboration between payers and providers. So it includes health plans as well as hospitals and physician groups and other providers. Each CCO signed up to provide care to a pool of Medicaid beneficiaries in a particular geographic area. I'll show you a 
show you that in a moment. And operations of the CCOs commenced um, anywhere between August of 2012 and January of 2013. So there were 16 CCOs, and they all started up operation about that same time. Um, and they received a capitated global budget for physical, oral, and mental health services. So I think the map is really quite um, important for understanding CCOs. Remember that in Oregon, um, you know, most of the state's population lives in this I-5 corridor, especially between Lane County and um, Portland. Um, so for the most part, CCOs have non-overlapping geographic areas. In some areas, Portland and Southwest Oregon especially, there was geographic overlap. But in, in, for analysis purposes, you can think that every, nine out of 10 um, Oregon Medicaid beneficiaries were enrolled in one CCO starting in 2014. They might switch, but generally they stay in CCO for a significant period of time. Um, that, was, that happened early 2013. A year later, in uh, early 2014, Oregon expanded Medicaid. Uh, the population, the number of Medicaid enrollees went from less than 600,000 to over a million. So in a very short period of time, Medicaid became the health insurance program for about one out of four people in Oregon. And Oregon's uninsured rate dropped to less than 5%. So despite the problems with the website, um, Medicaid for, for the uh, health insurance exchange, Medicaid expansion in Oregon really covered a lot of people with health insurance. But there was not a systematic surveillance system in place to measure whether the, the CCOs and ACA expansion were having um, an effect, as, as hoped, on the health of Oregonians. And, and CDC was particularly interested in understanding the impact on women of reproductive age and their young infants. And so they funded us starting in 2013, just before Medicaid expansion, um, to examine those events and, and their effects, those examples of policy changes in their effects. And so the project had three specific aims, to develop a research agenda um, about the issues that I just described. And then the core activities were these two. First of all, to link some large data sets uh, for women age 15 to 44. So that's the CDC definition of uh, reproductive age. Uh, and their infants, and we actually were able to expand the definition of infants for from zero to age three, not just one, but for the first three years of life, get data for all those kids. Um, and the data started in 2008, which is when the current revision of the national standard birth certificate became available, going all the way through 2016. So that means we had three, uh, let's see if I'm counting right, about six years of data before Medicaid expansion three years of data after Medicaid expansion. And then conducting the planned analyses and dissemination funds. We, uh, we can, I, I don't know that we put a count on how many analyses we've done, uh, but it's you know probably 15 or so distinct analyses that share some key features. <coughs> but the data sets that we linked, just in order from left to right, there was the Medicaid data, which includes enrollment or eligibility data about who's a member of Medicaid, as well as the claims, that is, hospitals, physician offices, pharmaceuticals, other services that they get. Um, that's linked to another data set about hospital discharges, which is just inpatient uh, hospital stays. Um, from the vital records department, we get death certificates and birth certificates. Deaths are pretty rare among this population. Uh, births are very common. Uh, there's about 45,000 women who give birth in Oregon every year. About half of those, more than half of those now, are financed by Medicaid. But we have birth certificates for every birth in Oregon. Um, there's another survey called PRAMS, which is the Pregnancy Research Assessment and Monitoring System, I think, which we linked but haven't really used that much to date. So each of these data sets is maintained independently by a separate agency at the Oregon Health Authority. And so we used a state resource called the Integrated Client Services Group 
They maintain a data warehouse. This is an Oregon Health Authority Department of Human Services joint collaboration. Some of the rest of you guys are actually working with them. Um, and they keep data on program participation going back 30 years, actually, to 1989. Yeah, that's 30 years. And so they link these records at the person level. So a woman who gave birth was on Medicaid and perhaps was discharged from the hospital, all has one unique ID number, and we get data that are de-identified. So we don't have name, address, social security number, any of that information. We just have a unique identifying number for that woman or that infant. And the process of, was that the client matching table at ICS links deterministically to Medicaid, to birth certificates, there's one birth certificate that covers both the mother and the baby, uh, deterministically links to birth certificates, and there's a probabilistic link to hospital discharge, because the identifying information in hospital discharge is not uh, as exact as by records. We have lots and lots of tables about linkage rates, generally greater than 90%. So large enough that we're confident we are getting a census of the events. So the last thing I'll say about the project overall before handing it over to John Ho is that uh, the timeline actually determines several of our analyses. So our data go from 2008, January 2008 to December 2016. There's two big events that happened there, CCO implementation, essentially at the beginning of 2013, Medicaid expansion at the beginning of 2014. That allows us to use quasi-experimental analytic designs. Um, and we'll compare, say for example, pre-CCO versus post-CCO. Or we may also then compare Medicaid versus other types of insurance. So we'll see multiple different types of comparisons, but all generally within this timeline for the data sets that I just talked about. So John Ho's going to talk about a couple studies, and then I'll talk about three. specific analysis. Uh, first one I'm going to talk about is about the uh, Oregon uh, coordinated, co coordinated care organization and its impact on prenatal care, access to prenatal care among women uh, of reproductive age, which is a sexual history, where published in MCH journal. Uh, so uh, again, our goal is to uh, empirically test whether coordinated care organization implementation has a positive or beneficial effect on access to prenatal care. And very briefly, uh, a little bit of background, prenatal care it, it plays a vitally important role for the health of infants and uh, mothers and fetus. And American um, what is it, uh, consortium of uh, obstetrician and gynecologists recommendation is that you know, each pregnant woman uh, use uh, prenatal care only during their pregnancy, especially uh, during the first, pregnant, uh, first trimester of pregnancy, which has been shown to be uh, linked to positive or beneficial uh, birth outcomes, pregnancy outcomes. And they also uh, recommend adequate, adequate uh, prenatal care, which is defined as at least uh, 14 weeks during the entire period of pregnancy. Uh, Unfortunately, in the United States, we have only 74% of pregnant women who access prenatal care during their first pregnancy, uh, first trimester pregnancy, and you know, delayed care uh, and inadequate prenatal care is very common, uh, more common among uh, women uh, covered by Medicaid program compared to uh, privately insured women. So, Jeff already introduced, so I'm going to touch on the, uh, you know, certain important things here. 
so Oregon coordinated care organization covers the entire Oregon and serving over 90% of Oregon health plan enrollees. Uh, is enrollment is mandatory, which is very unique compared to other, uh, you know, uh, account of care model uh, spreading throughout the country. Uh, again, it integrates, integrates physical mental and dental health care. And importantly, it focuses on the pre disease prevention and preventive care, like primary care, especially through patient-centered primary care home, which is the patient-centered medical home in other states. And this global payment, the uh, downside of global payment, you know, the, the goal, major goal of global payment is to uh, control the cost, right, by giving them, giving providers, especially CCO, lump sum money, so they work within that, uh, 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 you know, uh, kind of lump sum money, which given as like PM, PM, PM monthly risk adjusted. Uh, however, the downside of uh, global payment is the providers, so like CCO may uh, uh, behave to save money at the expense of quality. So to prevent that, uh, CCO uh, requires, uh, 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 implements also performance measures or quality measures, and timely of prenatal care, especially during the first trimester, is one of the performance measures. So CCO has clearly uh, incentivized uh, the providers to uh, kind of improve access to prenatal care, especially uh, during early uh, pregnancy uh, for you know, pregnant women. So uh, Jeff explained the data sources, and we, for this analysis, we use uh, Oregon birth certificate for three years, 2011 through 13. Uh, linked to Medicaid eligibility data for the same period. Also, we augmented data set using rural, urban, commuting area codes. Uh, the population, solid population we are talking about is Oregon women who were pregnant and gave live birth uh, during this period. Uh, we have a wash out period, um, so we dropped deliveries from August 2012 to April 2013 to uh, kind of measure the you know, effect of uh, CCO for those women who are fully affected by CCO. Otherwise, this, this is going to uh, muddy the true, really, true effect of CCO. And we had uh, about a little bit less than 100,000 women used for analysis. So our outcomes, uh, we have two, we have two domains of um, access prenatal care. The first is uh, timely serve uh, prenatal care and access to uh, advocate care. So th in terms of timeliness, we have two variables, uh, ever received PNC prenatal care uh, and uh, first visit during the uh, first trimester, according to the guideline. In advocate care, we have uh, two variables, number of prenatal care visit during the entire period of uh, uh, pregnancy. Also, adequate care is pretty standard way of uh, uh, kind of calculating, you know, adequacy. So we use the index, uh, which has been applied in, 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 in validated, uh, in and validated in the literature. In terms of analytic design, so we use quasi-experimental research design, yeah, so which is pre-test, post-test treatment contributor design. Uh, we have a policy group of Medicaid enrollees, so Medicaid women who gave birth, uh, financed by Medicaid, compared to non-enrollees. So non-Medicaid enrollees serve as our reference group. So we use a technique called the difference in differences. I'm gonna uh, show some uh, kind of illustrative example, the next slide. And we're controlling for various uh, pregnancy risk factor, and personal characteristics, and the secular trends, and seasonality, and so on. We applied logic regression model to estimate it, and we computed adjusted odds ratio. This is just simple uh, kind of illustrative example. I think it's very stylized. So we have, <laughs> uh, because we have a 
Wiman and Kosser, I'm going to explain here. So we have a CCO implementation here. Uh, we have a before CCO and post CCO period. And uh, for policy group and reference group. For policy group, uh, Medicaid women uh, use, uh, so the access to prenatal care is much lower. The rate is lower for Medicaid women compared to non-Medicaid women. So during, before CCO implementation, this is what, I, what are you gonna see, okay? So, and after CCO, uh, what happened, what could possibly happen is that there's a trend for this reference group which is, has nothing to do with CCO implementation, okay? So for CCO affected Medicaid population, however, in, in this figure, uh, exhibit you know, greater increase. So this is uh, actually, it should be DC, so difference uh, for reference group, and this distance is difference for treatment group. So using this uh, difference for reference group, we create counterfactual. Then uh, we just simply subtract uh, DC from DT, which gives us difference in difference estimate, which caps a true effect of uh, CCO implementation. Uh, so, each time, uh, so pre and post period, separately for Medicaid and non Medicaid population, we uh, use logic uh, function to estimate the predicted probability, so estimate pr probability so of um, outcome like uh, access to prenatal care during the first trimester. So we use cumulative logic uh, distribution function, then uh, in this uh, model. Uh, specification B3, which is the uh, uh, coefficient on the uh, M, which is Medicaid population post is post expand post uh, not expansion CCU implementation it is uh, interest coefficient on this interaction term captures uh, the ratio of two odds ratio. So it's the ratio of ratio of ratios. What it does, it captures the relative magnitude of odds ratio. Therefore, it captures true effect of this implementation on the outcome. So this is main findings. So as we expected, first of all, these are our outcomes. And uh, we're comparing Medicaid to non-Medicaid population. As you can see, uh, start with the ever received PNC, we see much greater, uh, almost everybody, probability of receiving uh, prenatal care uh, during the uh, uh, pregnancy period. And the uh, prenatal care during the first trimester, uh, also non-Medicaid populations, the rate is much higher. So it is about 73% for over, uh, the Medicaid population and 83% for non-Medicaid population. So these results are pretty consistent with what the literature has been reporting. So now our question is whether CCO uh, has a beneficial effect on Medicaid population, reducing the gap between Medicaid women and non-Medicaid women. So this estimate here is, is difference in differences system. Okay. And reported here is odds ratio. And you can see it, uh, you know, looking at the first visit in the first trimester, we see uh, like a three percentage point increase in the probability for Medicaid population compared to only slight increase for non-Medicaid population. So the difference to, in differences becomes uh, measured in odds ratio becomes 1.13, meaning that CCO has a, a positive impact on the probability of receiving uh, prenatal care during the first trimester. So it has positive beneficial impact. Uh, and as, you know, uh, represent uh, uh, not, not significant. So we find only significant uh, effect on the uh, uh, first trimester prenatal care visit. We uh, examined the population subgroup by uh, rurality first and ethnicity and uh, race. Uh, if you look at this side, so again, this is difference in difference assessment, we find significant result only for urban residents. 
In terms of ethnicity, we find significant positive impact only for non-Hispanic population. And in terms of race, we find significant results on only on white population and Asian population. So there is substantial heterogeneity in, uh, in terms of effect of CCO in our population. So the overall conclusion uh, is that the implementation of CCO has a positive beneficial effect on uh, the early use of prenatal care among Medicaid women of reproductive age. And then uh, CCO is also appears to help close the gap in prenatal care use between Medicaid and non-Medicaid. And we also find heterogeneity, substantial heterogeneity by population subgroup. And we find a lack of positive impact on rural residents and minority population. So this is area that you know, CCOs uh, must spend more time to kind of improve it. Now, in, as of January next year, the CCO 2.0 you know, not get started, right? So this has an important lesson for uh, you know, newly uh, kind of starting CCO implementation. This paper, we literally uh, use the same data set but we examine different outcomes. This time we examine not just not, not access, but actual outcome. So neonatal infant outcomes are, are our main focus and is published in Medical Care and Social Review. Oh. <laughs> so, again, okay, very briefly, uh, Adverse birth outcomes are really prevalent. You know, uh, over over ten percent of infants born in the United States are born preterm. Uh, preterm uh, is associated with a lot of later great health expenditure uh, and development disorder. So all sort of uh, you know adverse outcomes for infants and babies. So we need to deal with that. And in the literature, we see significant disparity in terms of birth outcomes, like African American um, uh, and uh, American Indian women have higher rates of poor birth outcomes, uh, higher rates of uh, poor birth outcomes for women in poverty, uh, also uh, for <coughs> women living in inner city and rural residence, and greater risk for especially Medicaid in all this. So CCOs, hopefully like prenatal care, can have beneficial effect in reducing this uh, disparity in the U.S. population. So this is what we saw before, so I'm going to skip that. But um, in, in this analysis, we uh, examine short-term effect outcomes and long-term effect outcomes. Our short-term effect outcomes is like, you know, those outcomes which likely to be uh, likely to change, you know, uh, relatively immediately uh, when they when uh, patients receive better care. So low birth weight and abnormal conditions uh, we you know, considered as short-term effect outcomes. Long-term effect outcomes we considered uh, low five-minute EPCA score. Uh, we use the threshold in the literature and congenital anomalies like uh, Down syndrome. Uh, infant mortality. Probably infant mortality is, takes you know, uh, longer time than other outcomes. We similarly applied difference in differences. Uh, we estimated logic, but this time not odds ratio. We computed what is called average margin effect. Compared to uh, odds ratio, average margin effect captures the degree of the effect. So it captures the magnitude of the effect. You know, not only just direction of the effect, you know, uh, upward or downward. Uh, <coughs> we were able to do that because the audience of this journal understand. It. Yes, so sometimes that drives our decision. So uh, main main result. So this is a uh, crude difference in differences. So you can you can compare. You can see the trend. For example, lower the way we see uh, for our. Popul uh, study uh, policy population, it reduced like this, 
and for non-Medicaid population, it actually increased. So nationwide, there's a trend, increasing trend uh, in low birth weight uh, during the time period. So this captures nationwide trends, so sort of as really nice uh, reference group. Uh, but we see uh, CCO population actually uh, have, having a better outcome after implementation. And this crude difference in differences captures the uh, effect of CCO not adjusted for anything yet. And we see all negative, meaning that you know even before we consider statistical significance, CCO seems to have a very uh, beneficial effect uh, on these neonatal so birth outcomes. Okay? Because it's all something that so negative means we improve. So we, we estimated two models, our benchmark model, our augmented model, almost the same, uh, uh, except that augmented model included the prenatal care variable in our model. Okay. So we, we find that you know, significant result for short-term outcome, effect outcome. Low birth weight, abnormal condition. Other variables always, always, uh, always negative, although not significant. So uh, to summarize uh, uh, what it means, so this is average margin fact. What it means is that we, we see 200% uh, uh, so, so, we, so this magnitude, in terms of magnitude, this, uh, uh, we, we can interpret that as it's like a two-fold decrease in the, in the probability of uh, having low birth weight, for example after CC implementation. So it leads to a substantial uh, beneficial impact. We uh, similarly find heterogeneity in the population. We find uh, a beneficial effect for only for urban residents, like uh, prenatal care. We also find beneficial effect for non-Hispanic population. Uh, for this analysis, we didn't do uh, examine the racial disparity. I don't recall why we didn't do that. We originally did. Probably Eddie didn't like it. I don't know. <laughs> so we dropped that on us. So again, CCO reduces adverse birth uh, neonatal outcome, uh, especially short-term outcomes. And we also see heterogeneous uh, effects uh, very similar to prenatal care outcomes. This is current analysis, one of the current analysis we're doing. We now switch our gear from CCO to Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid expansion occurred in the January 1st, 2014, and we examine its impact on depression, uh, depression screening and depression treatment among low-income women uh, in, in Oregon. Uh, also, very fully, depression currently, uh, you know, around 8.7% of U.S. population uh, appears to have depressive disorders at any point in time, compared to 6.7% in 2000. So it seems like there's an increasing trend. Uh, women are a greater risk than men, like. You know, as shown by this lifetime prevalence and 12 month prevalence, they have like 50% more likely to have depression than men. Unfortunately, only around 4% of US adults screened for depression each year. Uh, then, even though they screened or detected, uh, their access is significantly limited. Only 35% of women with severe depression and about 20% of women with moderate depression see healthcare providers, especially mental health care providers, for their symptom in the past year. And Medicaid program is a major source of financing for all behavioral health services, including depression. Also, it is a major source of financing pregnancy and birth in the United States. So Medicaid 
uh, provides significant, very important, uh, significant opportunity to improve uh, depression screening and treatment among uh, in the uh, among low income uh, individuals, including both uh, men and women and children and uh, adults. So we focus on again uh, the pregnant women. Uh, before ACA Medicaid expansion, uh, the old woman, uh, you know, uh, so to receive Medicaid benefit, women must be categorically eligible. And one of the categories related to pregnancy is pregnancy only Medicaid. Uh, however, the problem is that uh, women lose this emer kind of emergency Medicaid only uh, because of the pregnancy after 60 days of birth which disrupt the continuity of care and uh, continuity of health insurance coverage. Now, Obamacare, uh, so, so ACA, uh, gave state option to expand this Medicaid program uh, covering all individuals, including women, with family income up to 138% better poverty level, regardless of pregnancy status. Okay. So, th therefore, it uh, creates opportunity for women to be continuously enrolled before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and uh, interconsult period, and after pregnancy. It is currently adopted by 37 states. So, uh, among other data sets we have been linking, we use birth certificate linked to Medicaid data set, uh, claims, eligibility, and pharmacy data set. Uh, also, we link the hospital digital data set. And this is our basic uh, research design. We have policy group, we have a control group. Policy group include one pregnant uh, uh, woman during the pre period, pre you know, enrolled in pregnancy only Medicaid or uninsured when they're giving birth. Uh, but uh, after expansion, they are covered fully by Medicaid, so full Medicaid. Uh, control group, they didn't change their status. And these are outcomes we examined. We examined uh, 20 uh, different outcomes. Uh, for Five outcomes were screening separately for first, second, third trimester pregnancy and two month and six month postpartum separately. Uh, likewise, we examined five uh, different diagnosis outcomes. In terms of treatment, we examined psychotherapy using, uh, uh, identified using ICD codes and CPT codes, also a pharmacotherapy uh, identify using NDC code. Uh, we, our data, because we have a, a little bit different data period, we have data from 2000, or analyzed data from 2011 through 16, and it allowed us to uh, go a little bit beyond the you know, usual difference in differences analysis. So we were able to kind of control for not only observable selections, but unobservable selections uh, through additionally through fixed effect and inverse probability weighting, which is a method of purposes for weighting. So this kind of model might be called doubly robust estimates. This is main result. So this horizontal line, meaning that this is zero effect, so it, what we show it is here magnitude of effect and significance. Uh, in terms of screening, we see uh, positive uh, effect first trimester, but significant 90% level, uh, and insignificant for second, third trimester, but very significant two month postpartum, six month postpartum. So this uh, means that you know the uh, probability, critical probability of depression screen incre incremented by almost five percentage point, which is 50% increase. Uh, from the pre-expansion period. So this is a uh, non-trivial effect. About diagnosis, we, we see uh, that it's, it's only diagnosed during the first trimester, and is a uh, two percentage point increase uh, means that it, it, in our data set, it actually means a uh, uh, two-fold increase in the probability of having receiving depression diagnosis only on during pregnancy. In terms of psychotherapy, we again see 
huge increase during the post uh, birth, so two month postpartum, and even greater six month postpartum as we expected. And psychotherapy is almost always significant, and this pattern that during the postpartum it increased a little bit. So, conclusion, we find that Medicaid expansion in Oregon, Medicaid, improved uh, detection and treatment of depression among low-income women of reproductive age. And these are current state of Medicaid expansion. As you can see, most non-expansion states in yellow are southern states mostly. So it's kind of red state we expected. So the, to me, as a nation, we are losing you know, opportunity, very uh, unique opportunity to improve detection and treatment of depression by not expanding Medicaid. And it, uh, you know, preventing <coughs> depression uh, has numerous spillover effect. And you know, in terms of uh, uh, productivity, even productivity, so it helps market and helps our economy even. So we, uh, I believe, we really should uh, develop the agenda kind of keep pushing to uh, expand the uh, you know, Medicaid program to cover more low-income people. That's all I have. So I'm going to give it to Okay, so I, I, I'm going to, I'll, uh, I'll turn the mic on. <laughs> I will talk really briefly about our third study here. So, you, you uh, try re uh, please remember the various things we talked about, the, the design of the study and the population. Um, but what John just said about ACA Medicaid expansion, obviously I, don't, I think it's pretty clear that we wouldn't have done this study if we didn't think Medicaid expansion was a good idea. But what's, what's actually been really fascinating from an analytic and research viewpoint is that even when when we set up the quasi-experiment as carefully as possible, we do find positive results. Not always, but in many cases. So, so it's actually been, um, it's, it's been good to actually, I mean, it's been comforting to find that the evidence does support um, that Medicaid expansion improves the health of people in enrolled. Okay, so the question is, did Medicaid expansion expand access to, to preventive reproductive care for women in Oregon. So recent paper, Suzanne is the lead author. So preventive care is a good thing. Low-income women are less likely to receive preventive care. Uh, Medicaid expansion was expected to improve access to preventive care, but it could have actually reduced access for some other women. So in other words, if you have a set of Medicaid providers and they got a lot of new patients because of Medicaid expansion, it could be that, you know, the, the hope for um, out, uh, uh, outcome is that women who newly gained Medicaid were more likely to get preventive care than they were before, but if the providers get overwhelmed with patients, it's possible that you might be, see some reduction in service access for women who are continuously involved in Medicaid. So we're actually going to do two different comparisons um, to see whether the good news or the bad news happen or both. So, we um, studied five specific uh, evidence-based preventive care services, well woman visit, contraceptive counseling or services, screening for sexually transmitted infections, and screening for cervical cancer. And as I'll talk about in a little bit more, we did a comparison between women who were continuously <coughs> enrolled in Medicaid before and after ACA expansion. And then we did another comparison between the after ACA expansion between those women who had been continuously enrolled and the new women who were enrolled just as a result of ACA expansion because their incomes now fell below the, uh, the higher threshold, income eligibility threshold. Um, all women, we used Medicaid enrollment and Medicaid claims created a person month panel data set. Um, we um, decided, we, we broke women into non-expansion versus expansion. Um, 
based on whether they were or were not enrolled in December of 2013, um, before and after ACA expansion. So we were able to use that data and produce two different groups. Right? So we had a group of women, so we had about 83,000 women uh, who were enrolled in Oregon Medicaid before expansion, um, and about uh, 100,000 afterwards, um, and another 73,000 women who just became eligible. So these women were eligible because of pregnancy or other criteria that did not change as a result of the ACA. The far right-hand column is women who were enrolled just because of the ACA expansion. So we did one analysis pre-post ACA and another post-ACA analysis of expansion versus not expansion. So you'll see two different sets of results. Um, we did, in this case, Poisson regression models adjusted for robust standard errors, calculated marginal effects, similar to what John would just described. But it's kind of the patterns are kind of interesting here. So what these are, these show graphs. Uh, dotted lines are the expansion population. Solid is the non-expansion population. So the dotted lines only start in 2014. And we see that for well woman visits, the rate of well woman visits among women who are continuously enrolled is pretty flat. But for those women who are newly enrolled, it started at a higher level and dropped down. So we took this as evidence of some unmet need that was satisfied over the course of the first couple of years. Uh, contraceptive services, the rate remained pretty flat for continuously enrolled women. New expand, women enrolled in expansion actually were less likely to use contraceptive services. Um, contraceptive counseling, though, was pretty similar for the two groups, but it gradually went down over time. So again, you know, we're seeing some, we're not seeing exactly this, these trends are not the same for each of these three outcomes. Um, for sexually transmitted infection screening, it's almost the opposite. The rate actually went up slightly, especially in the last year, and it was very similar for expansion and post-expansion. Women, um, you all probably hear, have heard about uh, pretty significant growth in STI rates in Oregon, so this really didn't surprise us. Uh, cervical cancer screening, pre versus post ACA, it went down from 47% of women to 40%. This is cervical cancer screening. The, the first four graphs that I showed you are annual rates of screening. Um, or services, these are receiving services at least once within a three year period. So we can't draw the nice trend, but we did see that pre versus post screening access, seemed, uh, cervical cancer screening rates seemed to have gone down, but they were very similar for the women who joined just after expansion versus later. So the regression models allow us to test whether controlling for all of the other factors uh, similar to what John Ho just described and adjusting for a secular time trend, whether the change of ACA expansion had a statistically significant effect. I think if you look over here at the average marginal effect column, you'll see the value of the 95% confidence intervals. You also, if we compare pre-expansion versus post-expansion for the women who were continuously you know, enrolled over that same period of time, all of the values are less than zero. So there were some small decreases in service access for women enrolled before and after, but those values are all less than 2% except for the cervical cancer screen. So there's some small decrease. That's not such good news, but not terrible news. And then for the um, women who were enrolled only after expansion, uh, rates of um, Rates were actually very similar to the uh, women who were enrolled because of previous Medicaid criteria. So it's not, it's a mixed picture. Some, some rates somewhat higher, some rates somewhat lower. But the message here is that women who enrolled after ACA expansion received services at very similar rates to women who were enrolled before. So um, on the assumption that most of these women were uninsured and probably were at much lower rates of service utilization before, Medicaid expansion kind of brought them up to where we hoped they would be. So the, in terms of the good news, bad news story, um, there was some small differences in utilization. You know, the good news is um, women who gained coverage after expansion got services at similar rates to women who had coverage before. 
there was a small but not uh, probably not clinically significant decline uh, for the non-expansion women. Uh, and there's potentially some other things going on, some other time trends like changes in cervical cancer guidelines or increasing STI rates that are not related to ACA expansion. So there are some data limitations, especially when we didn't have other data outside Medicaid. Uh, but basically, Medicaid expansion did seem to improve access to services and not uh, significantly reduce access for people who otherwise were not. So that's, uh, that's four different analyses about pre and post CCO, pre and post ACA, um, all very quickly. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I have a question about the subgroup analysis, particularly in the first paper. You conclude that um, mostly the, the first was seen in, uh, in, in uh, non Hispanic whites and, and urban, in urban areas. But the, the slide went very quickly, but I, 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 kind of, I thought I saw some effects in all the other groups, only that were non significant. My concern is that the sample size it was much smaller in those groups. So I, I, I don't know if, uh, again, I, I couldn't see very, but it seemed to me like the effects were present in, in every single group, or not all, in almost every single group. So I'm a little concerned about this conclusion phrase as only seen in, in, uh, in non hispanic wise, because um, it's just that could be has to do more with sample size. Yeah, that's, thanks. Uh, that's a good point. We. I, I believe we uh, spent you know, a reasonable amount of time discussing that uh, among ourselves. Uh, and that, that's might be so like for for example uh, for you know American Indian, Alaska Native and Hawaiian Pacific Islander, uh, we, we might we have a relatively similar size, sample size than uh, white and black. So we, you know, uh, did kind of other kind of analysis like white versus non-white things like that. So just you know, like uh, uh, creating you know, non-white category, just comparing and you know, we as you can see, uh, we didn't find any significant result. So, uh, but overall. Uh, we, we didn't end up with really small cell size. So it seems like it's not really, you know, mainly driven by, uh, you know, the cell size. Though. So there was, our, I, I recall that there was our conclusion. So we, we discussed that during the kind of video process. And yeah, we, 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 we had, <laughs> yeah, we, we talked about that issue yeah. a lot in the analysis. Right. So we, we concluded that this, you know, the cell size really not driving our result. But, you know, uh, that's a really good point. We, yeah, we also struggled with uh, some time. Yeah. And there's, there's, uh, can I add one? Oh, yeah, sure. So, in other analysis, because uh, th this particular audience uh, like uh, subsample analysis, but you know, uh, before this, we uh, actually used a full sample and used a triple interaction model, then we actually found the same result. So. <laughs> I was going to say there have been other, other more descriptive analyses of CCO performance measures also show differences across racial ethnic groups that sort of parallel these. So we, we weren't surprised, you know, we, we found things that were comparable to other, other independent results. Who else? Michelle? <coughs> I have two questions, uh, one for this paper and the one for the next one. So in this one, um, it's more like I wanted to know what's the rationale behind it because it was found that there was an increase, significant increase in the first trimester care, uh, but after that the adequate number of visits was insignificant. So what could be a rationale that there is, ladies are coming in for the first trimester but not following up? That's the first question. And so uh, oh, our interpretation is when women started to, so CCO uh, can improve uh, all the initiation of prenatal care. 
but not necessarily the total number of uh, prenatal care. That's interpretation. And advocacy of care in that uh, is an important uh, uh, component of this number of you know, prenatal care during the entire pregnancy. Okay. So we, we didn't find significant effect, but you know, the direction of the relationship is similar. And the second, can I just ask the okay. second one? Okay. For the second paper, okay. where it was the neonat, I don't understand how CCO could have an effect on congenital abnormalities. That was something which I didn't understand. Like why would why was congenital abnormalities included? Because that is, I think, it's irrespective of what system of care is there, it's going to happen if it's going to happen. Yeah, so, I mean, if, for example, access to prenatal care and other support, can be improved after you know through system implementation that helps women, uh, for example, uh, from having more kind of planned pregnancy, for example. There's there's one just pathway I can you know suggest, but you know there are other multiple pathways that how that affect and overall you know, all different kinds of birth outcomes. So, please answer your question. You can be skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I have uh, two questions also. One is sort of technical on, um, you know, obviously these two, well, in all of these studies, you, you might be comparing, for example, Medicaid and non-Medicaid Medicaid is very different populations. And I understand you have data limitations. But do you have some sense of whether the trends are similar? I mean, I understand the levels are different. But yeah, so we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, we regularly test the uh, uh, pellet trend during the pre-expansion period, and graphically, their pellet, we also ran some first application analysis, more statistical test, uh, using, you know, only using data for pre-period, and <coughs> introducing, like, more classical effects, okay. and we, we find nice, you know, all insignificant okay. effects. Okay. So it seems like that assumption is met. Yeah. My, my second question is just, especially on the CEO, COO implementation, but I remember of, I think his name was Dr. Bruce somebody, Meyer? No, I don't know. Who came in last year and, and, and did a lecture also on COO implementation. Yeah. Yeah. And who was it? Colbert. Colbert, that's right. Um, and, and it was, I mean, there's so many different things involved. Sorry, CCO. Uh, there's so many different things involved. Like, what do we think is driving some of these where you do see significant changes? There's a lot of different things happening here. Is there any way to kind of distinguish what is actually driving some of these changes? I, I, so, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So, at many level, you know, electronic health record and, you know, exchange can you know, exchange patient information, um, and, you know, very efficiently, effectively mm -hmm. in, in time. That helps, uh, you know, for kind of clinicians, you know, to see, you know, patients appropriately. Also, you know, CCOs like, um, you know, they, they have clear incentives for collaboration, coordination, mm -hmm. especially for those who like to incur high medical expenses. and. Also, CCO has very clear guideline on you know their performance measures. So, you know, reducing cost doesn't come with uh, you know like you know sacrificing the the quality of care. And you know, like other ACO, having really clear and a little bit ambitious uh, kind of uh, you know, performance you know guideline, I think that helps CCO you know lead to implementing quality. Mm -hmm. I think about that from an implementation science perspective, that, that there were, that the CCO, CCOs did multiple things all at once, but that different CCOs did a different mix of things. Um, so for me, a future research question is whether we can measure a CCO characteristics with sufficient precision to tease out some answers yep. to that question. And, 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 not, and also have enough years of post Data. Great. Maria, I think is it two o'clock there? Okay. I think we should let everybody go. Thanks for joining us. And we're, we're, if you have any other questions, we're happy to, to uh, talk more.